There was a big high wall there that tried to stop me. The sign was painted, it said private property. But on the back side, it didn't say nothing. This land was made for you and me. If you live in England today, you have the legal right to simply walk on about a grand total of 8% of the land in your nation, and only 3% of rivers and waterways in England and Wales are legally accessible. This is actually more than a few decades ago, but under capitalism we nevertheless live in a historical epoch where our access to the land we live on, even outside of settler colonial oppression, is at an all-time historic low. How did we get here? This video is the first in a short series of follow-up thoughts to my video, The Theological Case for Land Back. In that video, I asserted that modern land ownership relations are fundamentally tied to the development of capitalism. In order to understand that claim, as well as to situate the Land Back movement in its wider material context, this video will offer a very brief discussion of European land relations, how they developed, and how they were propagated around much of the world by imperialism and colonialism. Before digging into this topic, however, it's necessary to briefly challenge the preconceptions with which we approach the study of history. Contrary to the colonialist narrative propagated by European education systems, and often, we, often unwittingly taken up by many socialists, history is not a simple linear progression, with one stage following another from hunter-gatherer or primitive communist societies to pastoralism to agrarianism to feudalism to capitalism to some socialist future. Different societies and communities developed in different ways at different times according to the particular material conditions in which they find themselves, and the social movements which arise out of those conditions. We often imagine that hunter-gatherer precedes the more developed farmer, characterised by Eurasian grain-based monoculture, but there are many other kinds of farming and natural cultivation in the world, and we even find cases such as around 3300 BC on the British Isles where people who'd previously adopted the continental practice of cereal farming abandoned this practice, developing forward from farming to a nomadic lifestyle that mixed cattle herding with gathering hazelnuts as a staple food. In other words, they went from farming forwards to gathering. In this video, I'm going to present a very linear-sounding narrative. This is an intentional stylistic decision. It allows me to cover quite a broad breadth of history in its macroscopic terms without needing to become intimately acquainted with the minutiae and fine details of each successive decade, and it serves as a useful frame for understanding how sociological and political developments in one historical epoch lay the material conditions necessary for later changes and developments. However, it should always be understood throughout this discussion that any linear narrative of this kind necessarily paints over a great deal of nuance and complexity in the historical development of modern capitalist and colonialist societies. This video is not a detailed and perfect chronology of historical events, and if you want to fully understand the historical nuances at work here, significant further reading is necessary. This video is intended only as an introduction to the major broad broche historical movements and events which laid the groundwork for our modern notions of land ownership. With that caveat out of the way, let's begin. Now, various notions which might reasonably be called concepts of land ownership have existed in various degrees and alongside various types of materials conditions at various points in human history and in various locations. For example, in the Eurasian context, the earliest development of some notion something like land ownership is often connected with the early Holocene, with the development of grain-based monoculture and sedentary agricultural societies. However, we don't actually need to understand the whole history of land relations to understand the development of modern land ownership. All we really need to understand is the feudal system that immediately preceded it. As such, a reasonable place to begin the story of modern land ownership is with the conquest of England by William the Bastard, more commonly known as William I or William the Conqueror, in 1066. I'm starting with England because something that you will see if you look at this, the history of this is that actually England was quite far ahead of the curve in the development of land relations towards the most oppressive capitalist colonialist models. So, prior to the conquest of William the Conqueror, various forms of land ownership existed in England. You have minor lords for whom landless peasants called serfs worked in return for food and protection, 
You had tens of thousands of so-called freeholders, which were people farming for themselves and their sort of extended family on small patches of their own land. But the vast majority of Britain was commons. That's land owned and used by communities, protected by law for the use of the commoners. And these ancient laws that protected the commons are often attributed to Edward the Confessor. Under William I, all of England was divided between 180 barons who held the land as tenants on behalf of the crown, and, in turn, had the right to give part of that land to lesser nobles who supported them. The nobles, as a whole, then, lease out the land to the peasants who live and work on the land. These peasants pay a tax to the nobles for the right to live and work on the land, and a portion of this tax is given from the noble as tax to the crown for the continued right to the land. Even under this new feudal system, however, the traditional rights of the commons were preserved. Now composed primarily of land which was only leased to the peasants during peak farming seasons, or land left entirely untended, collectively called the manorial wastes, these commons were available for the use of the whole com community to gather firewood and turf for fuel, graze herds, and even farm. That is, the commons provided the basic subsistence needs of the community. This situation began to change in the 1500s, when Protestantism, or at least an approximation of it, arrived in England. Those with even a passing knowledge of English history likely know about the split between England and the Roman Catholic Church stemming at a political level from the Pope's refusal to annul Henry VIII's, Henry VIII of England's marriage to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, when he wished to marry Anne Boleyn. What those outside of England, or even those who are only, whose only familiarity with English history is the pitiful excuse for history education that the British public school system provides, will likely not know, is that this political and religious drama led to the most drastic change in property ownership since William I's original conquest. This is a period known as the Dissolution of the Monasteries. In a series of acts passed by Parliament in the 1530s, the Crown gained the right to violently seize land that had previously been held by the Catholic Church, monasteries, priories, convents, and friaries across the British Isles, expropriating their income, disposing them of their assets, and taking their land under the ownership of the Crown. While some of this land was given to the Church of England, some was retained by the Crown, the majority of this land was sold off again to fund wars through the 1540s to private owners, and these new owners, these new landowners, were mostly members of a new, wealthy merchant class which was developing in the urban centres, the bourgeoisie, or perhaps more properly, the class that immediately preceded them in feudal society. This began the period known as land enclosure. Using a series of acts of parliament, these new landed gentry began seizing the common land, enclosing it both physically with walls and fences, and legally, taking land which had been the common inheritance of the whole community, and forbidding anyone to make use of it without the permission of the landowner. This led to a series of violent conflicts as the new landed gentry, supported by the state, seized the communal property and the commoners attempted to fight back to protect what was theirs by right and prevent this seizure. A notable early example is the Midland Revolt of 1607, culminating in the Newton Rebellion, where between 40 and 15 civilians were murdered by the state, with the leaders of the protest hung and quartered. At the same time, the era of British colonialism began, with the first attempted Caribbean exhibition in 1578, the first attempt to establish a, con a colony in present-day North Carolina in 1584, and with the massive expansion of English imperialism and colonial ambitions taking place over the course of the 17th century. Importantly, what we see here is an intimate and comorbid relation between enclosure in the imperial claw and colonising systems. As peasants were evicted from their land in the violent clearances in England, Wales, and particularly in Scotland and Ireland, they were sent to work as peasants or indentured servants in building the colonies. The violent methods developed to seize the land from the commoners and suppress peasant resistance in the imperial core was deployed and perfected in, violent, in the violent dispossession and genocide of indigenous peoples in the colonies, and in a classic case of Foucault's boomerang, as more brutal methods of suppression and control were developed in the colonies, these were ported back to the imperial core to, to suppress peasant and working class resistance, forming the basis of the modern day police force. But as this land was violently stolen from the peasants at home and the native peoples in the colonial context, 
What became of those who originally lived on that land? Deprived of the means to sustain themselves, the peasants were driven in vast numbers into the cities in a desperate search for work, and the same class of wealthy merchants who had violently seized their land, transforming the commons into private property, were more than willing to oblige, creating vast industrial factories where the peasants were sent to work in brutal conditions for barely enough pay to survive on. Thus, a new class of people was created by these changing material conditions, individuals who controlled no property, not even common land, and so had no choice but to sell their very labour and life to a capitalist for a wage, or else starve to death. This new class is the proletariat, and thus the entire economic base of capitalist society was established. This is why Karl Marx refers to land enclosure as a central component of the primitive accumulation of capital. It was only by the violent seizure of land from the peasants and indigenous peoples that the economic base structures of capitalism were able to become established. However, while the economic base of society had been transformed, the core economic relations had changed from that between a feudal landlord and the peasant who worked on the land, to that between a capitalist who privately owned the means of production and the proletarian who must sell their labour for a wage, the political superstructure of society remained the same, with the king and landed nobles holding the majority of political authority. This tension between the economic base and the political superstructure came to a violent head in the mid-1600s in what is known as the English Civil War. This was the first true liberal capitalist revolution, preceding the American and French revolutions by over a century, and although it is often overlooked in discussion of capitalist rev revolutions due to various superficial differences, so it ended with a constitutional monarchy rather than a republic, for example, it actually follows very much the same pattern. The landed gentry, recognising the revolutionary anger of the working class due to the violent seizure of the land committed by the landed gentry, used that political unrest to mount a violent revolution against the previous feudal rulers, resulting in a revolutionary transformation of society as the old feudal superstructure is replaced by the capitalist political superstructure which the new capitalist economic base required, a superstructure wherein the property-owning capitalist class holds absolute political power. And that pretty much brings us to the modern situation. Parliamentary enclosure, that is, land enclosure under the direct dictates of the state, continued in the UK through to the early 20th century, and more informal land enclosure continues through private pur purchases and seizures even to this day. Uh, outside of the UK, the whole process generally took place later, historically speaking. The US and France culminated in their periods of enclosure with the capitalist revolutions in the 1700s. Most of Europe had their capitalist revolutions in the 1800s due to you know, further delayed processes of enclosure. And feudalism was not even replaced by capitalism in Russia until the start of the 20th century. However, in all modern capitalist nations, the underlying pattern was similar. First, the land is violently seized, enclosed, and placed into private hands. Then, the peasants, dispossessed of the land, are forced into the cities, where they are faced with the free choice of either giving their labour for a wage or starving to death. And finally, as the economic base changes, a tension arises between the feudal and monarchic political superstructures and the new capitalist economic base, resulting in violent revolution, which overthrows the feudal powers and establishes the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie usually in the form of liberal democracy, often republican. The details vary from place to place, depend on the particular material conditions in a given time or place, but the outline is similar, and two important points remain in all such cases. Firstly, that private land ownership, the violent seizure of common land, is a necessary prerequisite for capitalism. Capitalism is not possible until the people are violently dispossessed of their communal right to the land, and secondly, that capitalism and colonialism are merely two sides of the same coin, and that the dispossession of native land is as much an essential property of capitalism as the enclosure of the commons in the imperial core. I started this discussion with a simple question. What is the connection between private land ownership and capitalism? I hope this discussion has made that answer clear enough. Private land ownership, and the violent seizure of common land this implies, is a necessary prerequisite for capitalism. If people have access to the land around them as sustenance, you cannot threaten them with death if they will not work in your factories, and thus the whole exploitative capitalist system cannot sustain itself. 
deprive the commoners of the land, and they have no choice. A similar situation remains true in the settler colonial context, although it's complicated by the hierarchical relations of white supremacy. By depriving indigenous nations of their access to the land, the settler colonial state deprives those people of access to the means of subsistence. They are deprived the ability to provide for themselves, and so are forced to either die, or become dependent on the settler colonial capitalist system for basic necessities such as food and shelter, which places them at the mercy of the violence of that self-same system. However, I hope this discussion has also shown why the call for land back, or more broadly, for the dissolution of private land ownership, is necessarily a revolutionary socialist call. Without private land ownership, the coercive system of capitalism cannot sustain itself. Therefore, to truly call for land back, to truly demand the abolition of settler colonial and capitalist land ownership, is equivalent to calling for the dissolution of the capitalist system as a whole. Assuming that YouTube doesn't strike it for copyright, I started this video with a verse from Woody Guthrie's song, This Land Is Your Land. It's a song, which I've been told, is widely used in the indoctrination of American children into the fascistic death cult that is American patriotism, and the colonial overtones, or even just tones, of a white man singing about Turtle Island with the line, this is my land, are certainly not lost on me. But beyond all that, at its very heart, this is a song which aches with the weight of alienation from the land, which enclosure, private land ownership, and colonialism bring. The verse which I chose to start this video with declares, There was a big high wall there that tried to stop me. A sign was painted, said, private property. But on the backside, it didn't say nothing. This land was made for you and me. Which, I feel, is an excellent representation of the underlying absurdity of land ownership and how easy it is to undermine and reject. And in all this, it is worth taking a moment to recognise our own place in the dissolution of the absurdity of private land ownership. We do well to recognise the successive of groups like the New London Mutual Aid Collective in reclaiming and making use of the modern manorial wastes. Private land which was left to rot by investors being turned into public housing or a fruit orchard. However, it's also necessary to recognise that such successes come in the face of the threat of extreme violence from the capitalist state, are limited in scope, and to be acknowledged alongside many similar attempts which failed due to violent state suppression. As long as the capitalist state exists, most attempts to undermine land ownership will be met with state violence and repression. But this does not mean that we should stop trying, and further, it merely reinforces the truth that whatever political action we take, I'm obviously not uh, officially legally condone for legal purposes I do not condone any legal action, the dissolution of all private and colonial land relations, the undoing of the generational sin of land enclosure, must be a central demand of our political movement.